So as we move from the left to the right in the periodic table, the radius keeps on decreasing, right? This is because as we move from the left to the right, we keep adding more and more protons. But the electrons, the outer electrons, they still lie in the same shell, right? Remember, across a period, the shell number doesn't change. So now you have more protons, more nuclear charge pulling on the same shell of electrons. So therefore, the size decreases as we move from left to right across the period. So left to right, the atomic size decreases, but if you go down any group, let's say if you go down group 2, you can see that the radius keeps on increasing. Now down the group, even though we are still increasing protons, but the electrons are now being added into new shells, right? So as we go down the group, the shells increase and the outer electrons are now at a much bigger shell, much farther away from the nucleus. So therefore, there is an increase in the atomic radius in spite of increasing nuclear charge. So left to right, the radius decreases, but as you move from top to bottom, the radius increases. Having said that, things aren't always so straightforward. For example, if you look at the P block, so if you look at boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen and fluorine, you can see that the radius doesn't seem to decrease by much, right? Even if you look at other p-block elements like aluminium, silicon, phosphorus, sulfur and chlorine, even out here the radius doesn't seem to decrease by much. But as you move into the s-block, so as you move from potassium to calcium, you can now see that there's an appreciable decrease in the radius, right? Moving further into the d-block, even out here, there's a noticeable drop in radius between calcium and scandium. But as you move further into the D block, the radius doesn't seem to decrease by much. And for iron, cobalt and nickel, the radius is almost constant. And there's actually an increase as you move into copper. And there's an even further increase as you move into zinc. So what's going on? To really understand what's happening behind the scenes, we need to talk about the shielding effect. So what's shielding? Let's take a look at the D block. So as you move from scandium to titanium to vanadium to chromium and so on, the number of protons, the nuclear charge is increasing. But the corresponding electrons are not being added to the same shell as we expect when moving across the period, but instead they are being added to the inner shell the inner 3D subshell. So while the increasing nuclear charge tries to pull the outer electrons towards itself, the added inner electrons actually repel the outer electrons and try to push them away. This repulsion cancels out some of the attraction so the outer electrons don't feel the full force of the nuclear charge or in other words, we can say that these inner electrons actually shield the outer electrons from the increased nuclear charge. So if you look at the radius from scandium to titanium to vanadium, the radius decreases. There aren't many d electrons to do shielding. But as the d subshell starts filling up, the shielding kicks in. The radius doesn't seem to decrease by much and in fact for iron, cobalt and nickel it's almost constant. Then as the D subshell becomes almost full, the radius actually increases as the repulsion factor now becomes dominant and pushes the electrons away. So therefore we see this U-shaped kind of a graph. Now I'd like to take a moment and point out that all of this is really a simplified picture. We know that electrons don't revolve around the nucleus in perfect circles, right? The real story comes from quantum mechanics and the extent of shielding actually depends upon the kind of orbitals in which these inner electrons reside in. For example, the S orbitals are spherical and have high electron density around the nucleus, so they surround the nucleus and can shield the outer electrons really well. P orbitals have relatively lower electron density near the nucleus, so they do moderate shielding, while the D orbitals are actually more spread out, 
They have a much lower probability density compared to the S orbitals and P orbitals, so they actually do poor shielding. Shielding in D orbitals only kicks in when they are fairly populated. Now what about the F orbitals? Well, they are the worst shielders. F orbitals are super diffused and they are barely present around the nucleus, so they barely shield. So now, if you look at the P block again, the radius of boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen and fluorine doesn't drop by much. So why is that? Well, this is because they have these inner S orbitals which are great at shielding. So even though the nuclear charge increases as you move across the period, the S electrons shield well so the radius doesn't decrease by much. So even in aluminium, silicon, phosphorus, sulfur and chlorine, the radius doesn't decrease by much. But as you move into the S block from potassium to calcium, you can see an appreciable difference, right? This is because we are now at the beginning of a new shell. And in the preceding period, we have added a whole set of inner P and S orbitals. And remember, we are also adding protons along the way. So the nuclear charge is also increasing, right? By the time we reach potassium, the shielding is kind of maxed out. So as you move from potassium to calcium, there isn't any addition of electrons in the inner shell. So there isn't any increase in shielding. So there is a noticeable drop in the radius. Moving into the D block, we are now adding electrons in the inner shell. But initially there isn't much shielding. So the radius decreases. But as the shielding kicks in, the radius becomes almost constant and there's actually an increase due to repulsion dominating attraction at the end. Now moving from zinc to gallium, there isn't actually any further increase and this is because we are now moving into the P block. So the electron is being added in the same fourth shell, the 4P orbital rather than the inner 3D orbital. So therefore, no further repulsion takes place. So the radius of gallium is similar to that of zinc. Now I'm telling you this because if you look at this particular group, if you go from boron to aluminium, the radius increases. But on moving from aluminium to gallium, the radius remains the same. What? Well, this is because firstly, as we move from boron to aluminium, we are adding 8 protons, but on moving from aluminium to gallium, we are actually adding 18 protons. Remember, we also need to fill up this 3D orbital before filling up the 4B orbital and electrons in the 3D subshell don't do great shielding, especially in the beginning of the series. So therefore, there's actually a greater than expected decrease in radius across the 3D series. This is known as the D block contraction or the scandite contraction. And because of this, you can see that while going from sodium to aluminum, there's a decrease in around 30 angstroms. But on going from potassium to gallium, there is a decrease of around 80 angstroms. So therefore, the radius of gallium and aluminum becomes almost similar. And some books even mention the radius of gallium to be even lower than that of aluminum. Let's look at one final trend. As you go from scandium to yttrium to lanthanum, the radius increases as expected, right? But if you go from titanium to zirconium to hafnium, the radius of hafnium is actually smaller than that of zirconium. So what's going on out here? Well, this is because while going from titanium to zirconium, we are adding 18 protons but from zirconium to hafnium, we are actually adding 32 protons. This is because between lanthanum and hafnium, we have the F block, right? So we need to fill up the 4F subshell before filling up the 5D. And these 4F electrons are really bad at shielding, right? In fact, if you look at the radius across the F block, it just keeps on decreasing. There is no increase in the end like the D block in spite of having 14 electrons in the inner shell.
So the poor shielding of F makes the decrease across the F block much greater than expected and this is known as the F block contraction or the lanthanide contraction. Now the effect of the lanthanide contraction is not felt only on hafnium but also across the entire 5D series. In fact, if you check the radius of 4D and 5D elements, you will find them to be very similar. So the lanthanide contraction makes the radius of 4D elements and 5D elements to be almost the same and osmium, iridium and platinum with their high mass and small radius are in fact some of the densest elements of the periodic table.